Well, we're turning to look at this passage that we read in Paul's second letter to Timothy. And uh, we understand that this is the last thing that Paul wrote, at least the last thing that we have, the last thing that was inspired by God uh, and the last thing that he wrote to Timothy and we understand that what is happening is that we're hearing from a man who has one foot in the grave already and he is a Christian man and he's not just a Christian man but he is a Christian man who has been called to be a pastor uh, and a preacher That's Paul. And because of his situation, he's on death row, if you like. He's in prison in Rome and he's facing execution. And so he is reflecting on his life. And he's inviting Timothy to get ready for the fact that he, Paul, will not be around for much longer. And uh, that's going to make a difference to Timothy especially because Timothy isn't the same kind of character as Paul. He's not as robust in his constitution. He's not as strong or assured or as confident as Paul is. And Paul is very conscious of that and he's making provision for that when he writes to him. He's wanting to encourage him. But Paul is reflecting uh, on, uh, on his life and his ministry And at the same time, he's looking forward. Uh, The story is told of Samuel Rutherford, who was an eminent minister in Scotland a couple of few hundred years ago now. And he wrote to a man who wasn't a Christian. And in the course of writing this letter to this man, he invited the man to imagine his first meeting with Christ his first meeting with God and he invited the man in the letter to think about it and to imagine it it's good exercise and he asked him questions like this how do you think he will look it's a good question when you meet God when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ How do you think he will look? The next question was, how and where will you look? And then he says to him, rehearse the scene and have your part ready. And uh, the man who received that letter later on said it was that very letter and those very words that awoken him and his conscience by God's Spirit and he became a Christian uh, because of that well Paul is uh, doing some of that here and we've been tackling this letter from the point of view of the fact that we're not all pastors or ministers here and realizing that this was originally written to a minister or a pastor Timothy so we've been trying to glean from it get from it the stuff that's relevant for us regardless of whether we are ever going to be um, in some kind of formal ministry and we come to the point where we believe there are three themes that have been laid out before us in this letter and these three themes uh, have been uh, very very helpful for us the first one was relationship or fellowship. Got an awful lot to say about relationships. Even in that reading we had today, he talks at length about relationships with different people. Uh, he mentions them by name. So we thought about that and fellowship, and then in the middle of the letter, he talked a lot about what we could generally call resistance and the importance that as Christians there are a lot of things we have to resist in the course of our Christian life. Resistance has to become part of our discipleship. Or, we said what he was really arguing for, or asking for, 
was holiness. Holiness of life expressed practically by resistance to things which are not glorifying and honouring to God. And now in this last one, the third theme which covers, uh, which I'm suggesting covers the reading that we had today and takes us to the end of the chapter, Paul talks about things that remain and things that don't remain. So I want you to just try and mull that over in your mind today. And he's got a few of these things that he wants to mention uh, today. You remember in one of the letters to the churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation, in the letter to the church in Sardis, a place called Sardis, the church is encouraged to strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen the things that remain. Well, Paul's got something to say about this. And I want you just to have a look at it with me today. Um, I want you to see if you can pick out as we go through this little message the things that will always remain, the things that won't, the things that must, and see if you can sort them out in your mind as he does here. The thing that casts the biggest shadow over the whole of this section and this reading is his very clear announcement that he, he himself, is not going to remain. Among all the things that may or may not be around for much longer, he knows he's not one of them. He is not going to be there soon. He can feel it happening to himself. And he talks about it, and it casts something of a shadow. He puts it like this in verse 6 of chapter 4. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's preparing Timothy. He's reminding Timothy. He's getting him ready for what is going to happen. And he describes what's happening to him, and he describes it, as if he can already sense it, as if he feels it actually going on while he's writing, because he puts it in the present tense. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He can feel the slow, inexorable ebbing of his earthly life, slipping away, however long it's going to take, it's going to end apparently with a sword, and he's going to be executed or beheaded, but he can feel it. He can feel its uh, sort of grip on him. He's conscious of it, and it's going to happen soon. Uh, now, one of the things that fascinates me about Paul, without getting sidetracked, is how easily and readily he can make departures. Have you ever noticed that about him? He's at the one time very deeply, deeply in love and intimately involved in the lives of the people he ministers to and the churches that God's used him to plant. But he has absolutely no qualms ever, it seems, about turning around after a year or two or three and simply saying, well, now... Uh, I'm going off to the next place. I'll see you later. Or I might not see you later. Uh, I'm going off to the next place. He has this sort of um, strange grasp, if you like, on departures. And here he is making departure again. And he's not feeling sorry for himself. He's not inviting uh, any sympathy or empathy. He's just making a point, really. He's just making a statement uh, about... Uh, the end of his life being poured out like a drink offering uh, you, we've said before you can remember what drink offerings were like in pagan worship they were poured onto a hot altar and when you pour liquid onto a hot altar it, altar, it just evaporates and one of the commentators says this is 
Interesting that he should use this illustration to describe the end of his life because the commentator says what happens when you pour out a drink offering is this a hiss and a puff and it's gone. And that's Paul. A hiss and a puff and he's gone. Amazing, isn't it? There's no record of any funeral any thanksgiving don't know anything more about what happened even the fact that he was executed we don't have details about that really and now Timothy is going to fill his shoes so I get it Paul so you're not going to remain but you're telling Timothy he has to remain yes that's it that's exactly it that's where the tension is that's where the difficulty is and you and I need to think about this because as far as we can tell at the moment God would have us remain and um, unless otherwise we will remain for a few more years I trust most of us and we need to use those years for God's glory but Timothy, he says to Timothy, look Timothy, it's, it's not just a question of remaining. It's not just the fact that I'm going and you're going to be here. And you're going to continue where I left off. You're going to remain, but you have to remain in a particular way. You have to remain active. And this is why he says what he says. Um, in verse 10 of chapter 3 for example he says to Timothy you have carefully followed my doctrine my manner of life my purpose, my faith, my long suffering you've done that in the past now Timothy you must continue to do that you must continue you must remain in a particular way you must remain active you must remain um, forthright And as he's talking about this, he says, oh yes, Timothy, and by the way, there's something else that's going to remain. Not just you, not just the need for you to be active, but persecution is going to remain. I'm not going to remain. You are. Persecution is. The need to be active is. And Timothy is taking all this on board. And then... Paul reminds him that around him society is disintegrating there's degradation on every hand people are going to proceed from bad to worse to worse and worse and then right in the middle of this he suddenly confronts him with something else that's going to remain and what's that? that's the Bible you see that at the end of chapter 3 continue in the things you've learned and been assured of knowing from whom you've learned them that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, the holy scriptures which make you wise for salvation, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof nothing there in the past tense everything there in the present tense the Bible isn't going anywhere as much as people may wish it as as hard as the enemies may have beaten on it for thousands of years and are still beating on it it is not going anywhere it's not suffering any loss it's not losing any of its power or any of its impact or any of its fruitfulness in the hands of God and the Holy Spirit so Timothy take heart You'll, you'll have the Bible make sure you have the Bible Make sure you keep the Bible. I'm going, society's going down the tube, I'm going off to heaven, but you've got the Bible. The Bible will remain. Hold on to it, value it, keep it, read it, study it, love it, believe it, pray it, the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Miss all the junk 
all the stuff that's so unprofitable. It's entertaining, maybe, but it's not particularly profitable. But amidst all of that, there's this beacon, this light, this wonderful word of God that shines out for generations. So, the Bible remains. You remain. Remain active. Persecution remains. And then he says, and by the way, Timothy, reward remains. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. So nothing can take away from what you, as a humble, believing Christian, have invested in heaven. Nothing can take away from the treasures that you've laid up in that place where moth and rust don't or can't corrupt and where thieves can't come. So the reward remains. That's an encouraging prospect. Heaven remains because that's where the reward will be. Oh, and the church remains. It must. Otherwise, why is he mentioning all these people? On the one hand, he's under tremendous pressure and suffering persecution, and yet, even when he's told us there's been a mass defection of Christians, all have deserted me, none stood with me, and yet, before he finishes off, he's got a whole list of people. So the church remains. Are you encouraged by these things? We should be, shouldn't we? These things which are solid and lasting and spiritual and which we can depend on. The certainty of reward. The certainty of heaven. The certainty that there will be a church while ever the world remains, while ever history lasts. But all that is put in the shade by the one thing that's really the most important thing. And what's that? Well, the Lord himself. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever. In all the chaos all the change, all the trial, all the sin, all the trouble, all the weakness, all the illness, all the sickness, all the death, all the depravity, all the destruction, all the degradation, all the things I've done wrong, all the things you've done wrong, all the things you haven't done, you should have done, all the changing and the variableness of it all, well, fall back on this, the Lord remains The Lord remains. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing. Let me uh, close this overview of 2 Timothy with these words. Uh, from Alexander White who uh, has written lots of really good books he's an, he's an older author and commentator um, but this is what he says reflecting on Second Timothy um, he says and so it is when you reach the end of Second Timothy You are well read in Paul's old age. And in his old age, in what he writes, you will find far more repentance in his last years 
than even in the years immediately after his conversion and remorse. You meet with an ever deeper bitterness at sin and at himself as time goes on with Paul. And then you meet and then you meet with a corresponding amazement at God's mercy. You would do well to be a follower of the apostle. Go back then, he says. Go back then, deliberately and at length, and take many a good look at the whole at the whole of the pit that you had dug for yourself and in which you had made your bed in hell and come up from the mouth of that horrible pit come up again to that rock on which you now stand and see if the result will not be the same in you that it was in Paul Amen Heavenly Father thank you for the second letter of Paul to Timothy thank you for the things that remain give us grace today to take our stand upon them to trust to them, to hold on to them, to believe in them, to depend on them. Things that you have provided for us who are so undeserving, hell-deserving sinners, but you have provided this wonderful salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that it's unassailable, unchanging, sure and certain. Thank you that we have an anchor within the veil even faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance toward God so Lord help us to take your word to heart today take it away with us we pray in Jesus name Amen